But the thing I like, I like for crypto is that it opens the door for anyone to join and participate on a protocol or a user. Like, this is probably something that you don't understand much if you're from the US or Europe. But for someone in Latin America, especially in countries where we don't have full access to many things, like you get used to going to a site, you start reading news and like you get to, this video is not available in your country. The, those things, you, you kind of get used to it, but you don't really like them. So when, when a new product, a new product comes in that says, hey, you know, it doesn't matter where you're based, like the playing field is the same for everyone. That's huge. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Devs Do Something podcast. Today's guest is Santiago Paladino, a lead developer with Open Zeppelin, who has helped drive the development of the Defender product that the Open Zeppelin team has worked on, and he's also provided value as an educator for the space. Back in 2019, he wrote a book for web development professionals about how to get started with Ethereum. In this episode, we discuss the Defender product from Open Zeppelin how it was designed, some of the technical decisions they've made, and how it actually might help teams to manage smart contracts that have already been deployed. We also dive into the role of DevOps and traditional Web2 infrastructure and its role in making the UX for Web3 much better. And we also talk through Santiago's thoughts on the growth of the South American and overall Latin American Ethereum developer community. Santiago has a deep understanding of building products at the intersection of the Web2 stack and Web3 stack. And if you're interested in Ethereum as maybe a traditional Web2 developer now and want to get involved, or you're interested in just building uh, more traditional SaaS style applications that straddle both the decentralized world and the traditional world of web development, this episode's for you. I hope you enjoy. All right, so we're here today with Santiago. Thank you so much for being here, man. Hey guys, thanks uh, Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. So we're excited to get in, into a lot of your work um, at Open Zeppelin and a lot of the, the other work you've done for the space. But before we do that, I'd love to just understand how you got involved with Ethereum development in general. Sure. Uh, it was kind of by chance. Um, I, basically, I got introduced to Manuel Araos via mutual acquaintance. Manu is one of the co-founders of Open Zeppelin, and he's a crypto G in the space. Like he has been in Bitcoin for for a very very long time, and switching into switched into into Ethereum. I uh, just happened to land in a co-working space here in Buenos Aires. It goes by the the Voltaire House. There are a couple of articles written about it. It ended up being sort of an incubator for many different uh, crypto native teams that emerged from Argentina, uh, Open Zeppelin, Decentraland, Moon Wallet, and a couple of others. Um, just happened to sit next to the guy and say, hey, nice to meet you. I'm Santiago. Who are you? What do you do? Oh, I build smart contracts. You build what? And that's how I got pulled into, into the rabbit hole, basically. Uh, at that time, I was looking for, for a change in, in careers. I had been working on my previous company for almost a decade. Uh, oh, it was time for, for, a sh- for a shift. Um, so I started looking more and more into crypto. I asked Manu for a couple of other uh, couple other conversations to learn more, to start playing a little bit with the technology. Um, Basically, the guy told me, um, hey, since you're interested, how do you feel about doing a small project? Uh, I mean, as an excuse to learn, of course, uh, nothing else. And next thing I knew, I was working at OpenZapplin. Nice. Very cool. So OpenZapplin was your first foray into the space then? Exactly. Yeah. That was about five and a half years ago. Wow. Okay. So you were, you were there like at the beginning, it, basically in that, that ICO boom phase where you were probably oh, yeah. seeing all the early stuff, um, which is fascinating. Actually, one of the first products I built at OpenSupplink was a platform for facilitating ICOs. We had like a suite of tools, like white label tools that you could use for fundraising, for funding, for registration. And it was not super popular, not very well known, but oh, it was one of the first things I, I built when I joined here. Like shortly after we decided that hey, maybe ICOs is really not what we want to do as a company. Uh, so we shifted into more interesting stuff. 
Makes sense. Makes sense. So you, you worked there for a few years and then it, it looks like you wrote this book on Ethereum development for web developers. Uh, I, I, did you come from a web development background beforehand? Is that, was that, okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like for my previous job, I was several years working at uh, basically a software factory where we built mostly rich web applications for different domains. We focus mostly on DC surveillance and disaster response. Uh, but yeah, I got like, a lot of web traditional web two education there, and as I jumped into, into web three and Ethereum, I saw that hey, there is clearly a need for. I mean, there were some tutorials for people who wanted to start learning like from scratch, but I didn't see anything that was a good fit for. Hey, you're a developer, you already know how web application works. Okay, like this is the delta, this is that plus one that you need to go from web two to web three. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Maybe a good question then actually is. For web developers looking to get into this space now, right? The, the space has evolved since you wrote that book, but let's say that, you know, I run into web developers all the time that are like, hey, I want to start writing smart contracts. I want to build dApps, right? I want to get involved with this stack. Do you have any general advice for that, that cohort of devs that's interested in, in making that leap? Definitely. I think that the first thing is to unpack like all the different options that you just mentioned. Like you can or be a smart contract developer or act as an auditor or work on tokenomics and oh, you don't even know, need to know coding to do that. Or work on a app in which you can bring most of your uh, traditional web development background with you. Like there are many, a lot of many, many different ways to collaborate on, on the Ethereum space. And yeah, it strictly depends on what you're looking for. If you're looking for more like a full stack, uh, let's say where you want to know a little bit of contracts, a bit about that development and what it looks to me to have the full end-to-end -end working. I would say that my book still works. I mean, it's three years old, but oh, still covers the basics. Uh, there are many other much better resources now going around. Uh, I've always been a fan of what Austin Griffith builds around the speed speedruns and like building the whole app really quickly. I've heard very good things about the Solidity tutorial from, from Patrick Collins. Uh, there, there are like many more resources now out there that focus on, on different things. There are also more boot camps available that you can join. But um, yeah, I think that the important thing is that for you as a developer to understand how you want to approach the Ethereum space. Like you can begin by having like a generalized view, playing around a little bit, but then it's good if you say, okay, this is the part of Ethereum that, that I'm particularly interested in. Something else that I think it's still important in Ethereum is to know the basics, like to understand how the underlying technology works we still have plenty of, of abstraction leakages in, in the Ethereum development stack. Uh, it's not as bad as it was four or five years ago. I think things have, have improved a lot, but it's very important that hell, if you're building it up, you understand what's the transaction life cycle, what a reverse reason looks like, uh, what are gas prices, how a block gets constructed. Um, like all of those things are, are pretty much important if you want to do, if you want to build a good experience for your users. Are there any abstractions that you think are still particularly leaky that the tooling space should really focus on, <laughs> or maybe at least the education space should at least focus on uh, on improving? It's a very good question. Um, I think that uh, the whole transaction lifecycle could definitely use some improvement on on managing. Like right now, today, what a wallet does is it sends a transaction, and um, that's it. And you, as a developer pretty much lose track of that uh, once that happens. And maybe you get notified one, hey, transaction is back. Um, I think that better tooling for managing that entire life cycle could definitely be useful, like especially if the transaction gets dropped, if it, there is congestion, if the user speeds up, make sure that app knows about it. Like having better tooling as a developer to, to work around that, I think that's, that's important. Also the onboarding, could really use some help. I mean, today we default that, hey, if you want to use this, of course, how can you don't have a Chrome extension with if already filled in? And for 99% of the users out there, that's not the truth. I mean, we, I think that one of the problems with bull markets is that we get lazy when it comes to user onboarding. Like the best improvements to user onboarding happen during bear markets. And like, it's a good thing that we're in one now because it means that we can start focusing on it again. Like most of the work on meta transactions and gasless transactions happened during the past bear market. Then we moved into DeFi summer and it's 
hey, everyone should, should set up a MetaMask and configure everything. Why? Because they have the motivation to do that, because there's free money out there, go get it. Now that we're back in there, hey, now, we, now once again, we, we need to start thinking how to onboard users. And having like something easy where we can maybe start by setting up an application-specific wallet or even a custodial wallet, even though I had them, but to onboard users and give them a very, very easy way to exit that into self-custody, into their own wallets. I think that's, that's a workflow that there has been a lot of improvements on that, but still work to do. And also, it shouldn't be something that needs to be reinvented by every app out there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, on, on the topic of, of UX, we'll, we'll, get back, we'll get back to UX in a second, specifically developer experience. But yeah. let's get into your work at, at Open Zeppelin a bit. So it's my understanding that, that you really helped work on the Defender product. Am I accurate in that assumption? Yeah, that, that has been my focus for the past two or three years, yeah. Very cool. Very cool. So I I'd like to ask a couple of questions in, in a minute on mm -hmm. like developer experience and how it relates to security and all these different things. But can you just give our listeners an overview for those of them that do not know what, what Defender is? Can you give them an overview of, of what it is and, and who it might be useful for? Absolutely. Uh, Defender is a traditional software as a service uh, in that it provides a platform for secure automation, administration, and monitoring of smart contract based systems. Uh, it has a couple of different components. Think of it as a mini AWS for Web3 applications. And it has components to uh, set, automatically set up monitoring and trigger alerts or automated scripts when that react whenever something happens for one of your contracts. It has um, a private infrastructure that you can use for automating, like setting up hot wallets that you need to uh, use for sending transactions on an automated basis. It has interfaces for managing your contracts using multisigs, time logs, common contracts, or multi-party computation. Uh, like it has the main goal of Defender is to solve everything that happens once you have finished development. Got it. So this monitoring process, right? Like let's say somebody has an exploit, right? Being able to understand that happened as fast as humanly possible is obviously useful. Right. And also with a lot of the operations that happen, like there have been some very notable, like just human error things that have happened when upgrading contracts and things. So I guess that's the idea, right? Improving the developer experience and workflows to prevent some of these bad security instances from happening. Is that, is that right? Improving not, not just the developer workflow, like the whole DevOps workflow, like the keyword that we're looking at here is DevSecOps, like that workflow that integrates both development and operations with security as a top of mind concern. Um, like all of Defender, everything that's done at Open Suppling comes from a security first mindset and Defender is, okay, security first for operations, for help. You need to update your contract. You need to uh, push a proposal that's going to change some of its parameters. You need to send, I don't know, to keep updating an Oracle from a secure private key. You need to monitor your contracts to make sure that there is not, that there's no hack that um, an administrative action hasn't happened without your consent. All of those things are simplified by using OpenSable in Defender. Interesting. I like the, the framing of it being a tool that helps you manage everything that comes after you, you deploy a contract, right? Because not, honestly, not many smart contract developers, when they ship a smart contract, right? Unless they're just really hardcore immutable maxis who only care about immutability and they're like, hey, it's deployed, it's, it's code is law, right? If they're not that team, there is maintenance, right? So what, what are some of the, what's, what's the right way of framing this? I'd say, what are some of the biggest mistakes you see teams make after deployment? Is there anything you see commonly that you just wish people had a better edu edu education around or, or just avoided? Uh, yeah, you, you, you raise a good question. Basically, um, I mean, the reason why we started working on OpenSupply Defender is because we set out to speak with many, many different teams on the space. And we started, hey, what, what are your problems? How do you solve X, Y, or Z? And what we heard is that there was a massive lack of profession professionalization when it comes to ops in the Web3 space. Like, it's very odd to see a Web3 native team that have a dedicated operations team. And usually operations, it's, okay, yeah, sure, the lead developer will take care of doing that after they have finished coding, almost like an afterthought. Um, so for, for us, what you say, for like common mistakes we've seen, 
very poor practices when it comes to man securing and managing hot private keys, like just keys sitting there on a, on a shared server or on a .m file or stuff like that. Maybe these are keys that have the rights to manage millions of dollars um, or that they are used for updating an oracle or managing a bridge. I think that the Harmony bridge hack happened because of that. Um, we saw like poor practices also when it comes to administration. Uh, fortunately, the things have changed a lot in the past couple of years. Like every project is required to have at least a multi-signature wallet as an admin, like guarding the, guarding the project. Uh, back then it was common to, hey, like, yeah, sure, the admin is a key sitting on MetaMask, which is, I'm sorry, uh, which is definitely not the way to go. Uh, still, there's still a lot of improvements to do. Like there is not much tooling for uh, working with multi in combination maybe with time locks or with other security controls. So those are also practices that, that we want to push forward. And monitoring was is mostly non-existent across many projects in the space. That that has that started changing in the past year, half a year likely. From OpenSapling uh, have also been pushing Forta, which is a decentralized monitoring network, uh, with the goal of yeah, improving monitoring all across the space. Is this a lot of just traditional DevOps? Right? Is this a lot of you guys running servers that help automate certain things? Yeah. What does what does your stack typically look like? Right? Is is it just a lot of? I guess I guess you can you can elaborate. Sure. I mean, Defender is a again is a centralized traditional software as a service. Uh, it's as web two as you can get uh, when it comes to implementation, but it interacts and helps you manage all things web three. Uh, behind the scenes, Defender is a serverless application runs one hundred percent on AWS makes very heavy use of Dynamo, uh, Lambda, API Gateway, Cognito, KMS, SQS, like the usual suspects when it comes to serverless development. And the benefit of going serverless means that we don't have to worry about server management. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, Josh, I know you've, you've commented a little bit on some of the, the ways the teams manage keys and things like that, right? Um, so maybe, maybe you should, should go play around with Defender as well. Yeah, for sure. I think definitely, um, I think the overall awareness of, you know, this, this wallet security has definitely improved, especially like, I mean, if you're looking around, right, like even, even the sort of like crypto Twitter space where like you have more people that are kind of pushing, like, you know, th these are the kind of things to look out for. Like, these are the scams that people are doing show you how it's evolving and like show you how to manage keys, hot wallets, cold wallets. Like I definitely see some maturity, you know, with that, which is really nice. Um, I guess minus the uh, profanity generator <laughs> bug, but um, yeah, it's, it, it is pretty interesting, but I think to, and something that I kind of want to pick your brain on here in a minute is like, I've noticed that there are like two very different kinds of people that are sort of in this web three development space that, um, you know, are, are sort of like radically like opposite ends of the spectrum here where, you know, on one end you have these sort of um, like, they're, they're like very security minded and they, they have this mentality of, um, you know, you should verify, you should audit, you should, you know, have monitoring scripts, you should have these kinds of things and you put it all in place, right? And then on the other side, you have like, just basically these like, you know, um, cowboy coders, right? That like, they just like slinging stuff to prod and, and you know, just kind of like seeing what happens, right? And like, um, I don't know, do, do you think there's like, like, what, what's your take on this? Is there some middle ground there that maybe everybody should meet on? Or are you more of like, you know, especially being around security, are you a bit more like, you know, hard line onto the, onto the security side. What's your take? For sure, I'm more closer to the security side. Um, but I think that as with decentralization, as with many other things on the space, like, should be progressive. Like, you, it depends on how you expect your project to grow and to capture value and to manage assets from, from other users. Like, you don't need a probably you don't need a five-page uh, incident response plan if you're just starting and you plan on managing just a couple of thousand dollars. What's the problem here? Like a uh, couple of years ago, DeFi summer, literally every cowboy could throw a project directly to directly to production and get millions, millions of dollars on top of it. So there was a huge mismatch between like what the project could manage, was prepared to manage, um, like, what, what would be reasonable for it to be running. Um, again, I think that bull markets um, cause massive distortions when it comes to how, how projects operate. Uh, in more traditional, more normal scenarios, I think that, yeah, I mean, it's 
expected for a project, like to maybe start slow, uh, start accruing value, and evolve their have the means for evolving their security practices as they go. Like project could totally start with a multi sig to begin with, expand it to the you know, council with other members of the community, throw in a time lock, move on to governance, adding a postcard at the end. But you don't need all that complexity from day one. Like you can, like you can, you can iterate on that as long as you have that as you have that plan from day one, right? Like you want to have a concrete plan for improving and building your security when it comes to administration, when it comes to monitoring, when it comes to securing your your assets. We we mentioned immutability versus this this up, these upgradable patterns and things. Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts on the optimal levels of control that a project should be able to still have over their contracts and deployed code? Are you a proponent of like kill switches that can stop bad things from happening after they've happened? Do you like to see teams really just optimize for decentralization as much as possible? Is it a spectrum? I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. I, I understand it's very, very controversial topic. I'm more on the side of upgrades and keeping control of the project, uh, especially on early days. Like on early days, you want to be able to iterate, to react to user feedback, to add new features, to be able to react if there was a bug in the code because, come on, no one codes perfectly on the first round, not even after one, two or three audits. Um, so having that kill switch, that emergency pause if you want, or something that lets you stop the bleeding in the process of a hack and properly react to it, to me, it's super important. Um, like the way I see it, and um, like this depends from project to project, like every business is different for sure. But if you're starting early, you're capturing value. It, beca- it means that your users trust you, that they have their faith in you. So I don't see it as, as bad as starting not fully decentralized. That's a personal opinion. I know that like different projects and different teams have completely different takes on this. And again, it's a spectrum and there is room for pretty much everyone. I think that what's important is that if you start with a more sort of centralized stance, you have concrete plans for decentralized, concrete and real plans for decentralizing later down the road. Gotcha. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. On on the side, okay, so this is back in more into the details of Defender and your stack and DevSecOps in general. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that right now, one of the things that's happening in this, this process of building toward better UX is people are running these automation services more often. I think Gelato has gotten more popular. Uh, Chainlink Keepers seems like it's getting used a bit more, although you have to have links. So there's, it's always not always the greatest, but do you think that that direction of like account abstraction plus automation is a big direction for the space? Do you see that just being something that's kind of important now? How do, how do you think about some of those automation tools? No, I think it's super important. Um, it's not just automation tools. Uh, it's having off-chain infrastructure that complements on-chain. Like for sure, you can have fully on-chain applications, and they are super fun to see and to be and to see how they manage around to keep everything on-chain. Like I love SVG generation on-chain. Uh, I think it's something horrible that should have never happened, and I love it at the same time. Uh, but for real projects, for real applications, uh, I think that it's, that it's super important to have like, things that happen on chain and things that happen off chain. And there should be room for both. Um, what I would expect is that, and it has been happening, right? Uh, that as projects evolve and we build more and more complex applications and protocols, that there is this layer that happens on chain, but there's more and more things being moved off chain. Um, Automation is a big part of it. Um, gasless transaction is another one. Indexing is another one. Like there are more and more parts that happen around the context. Like the protocol itself still has all the components, all the basic building blocks it needs to stay alive if someone is willing to run this automation or index or whatever it is. But to provide like a good user experience, you need like these components uh, around it. And I think that's also in line with where, where I see the industry going the, in the long term. Like, I think that the Web 2, Web 3 divide is fundamentally wrong. Like, today you don't see, oh, no, I'm going to call the Web 1 application, not Web 2, because they're evil. Uh, it's like, yeah, Web 2 is what we do. It's what we build. Like, we, we build a web, and that's it. And I see a point where 
crypto adoption has grown enough that hey, crypto is just another tool for building your applications. Um, your applications run in a browser because they are easy to distribute that way. Um, you can capture value by interacting with certain protocols that happen on a decentralized layer. Sure. And it's like another building tool that we have for creating awesome stuff, but it's not, it should not be what defines what you're doing. Like it's not, Hey, I'm a crypto company. It's like you're, you're starting with the hammer, the beautiful hammer that you want to use for the stuff. No, you, you want to solve a problem and crypto is like something else on your tool chain. Yeah. So maybe the underrated skill set for the next couple of years in, in, in web three development or blockchain development and building applications that are primarily built around a blockchain use case is DevOps, right? That's actually an interesting potential, potential idea there. Do you think that the, the web two stack is going to be enough to service some of those automations in, in off chain infrastructure? Or do you think that people within, I guess, our world and our niche will really try to build their own versions of these tools? I mean, you, you've done this yourself with Defender, although I'd say it's more, your innovation is more on like just a fully managed SaaS solution than you building your own servers, right? Do you think that people will build custom backend infrastructure protocols and things to, to service this market? Or do, you, or do you think that it's going to be a lot of AWS servers and things like that? How do you see that playing out? I mean, it's already happening today, right? Like you have a, a centralized automation, you seeing the Defender Autotask using Gelato, and you have decentralized using Changing Keepers, using uh, the Yearn Keeper network. Um, what changes is how, how it's incentivized. You have centralized monitoring using Tendal and Defender, and you have decentralized monitoring using Forta. Um, so you have a, like centralized indexing solutions. You can use OpenSea's API, or you can use Etherscan, or you can go with the graph. Again, like, for like for every single one of these of these problems, let's say you have a centralized option and you have a decentralized option, uh, which I think it's super interesting to see. Like the decentralized options basically give way to new business models. Like it lets you spin up like sort of a, let's say an Airbnb of indexing, uh, in a way. Um, but my point is that the code that you are throwing out there to build, whether it's Tenderly or the graph, whether it's chaining keepers or um, gelato, it's the same. It's soft chain code. The only thing that changes that changes is okay, is this decentralized? Is it decentralized? How how are incentives managed? Uh, but like the technology that that we are using for, for doing the, the core of the job, it's it's very similar. Sure, there are different problems around them, but I don't see this as a fundamental distinction on. Mm -hmm on how you're, how you're creating, how you're engineering it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the process is the same. I think that the thing that can be different is is the points of control, right? I think that's maybe where it, where it gets a bit different, but I think that makes sense. Yeah. I think that makes sense. Josh, what do you think about that? Josh is, so for background, Santiago, Josh is a, uh, I don't want to say he's a decentralization maxi because he's, he's a practical guy, right? But, you know, I'm sure he's got a thought here. What do, what do you think about the way that plays out, Josh? Yeah, I mean, definitely, like I lean decentralization, uh, you know, where it makes sense, right? And um, in places where it's critical, right? Like, for example, like the consensus layer of Ethereum, that's critical. That should stay Absolutely. as decentralized as possible, right? But then when you have like uh, layer twos, for example, right? Like I don't, I don't, I'm not aware of a layer two that doesn't have some sort of centralized sequencer right now, right? Like there's, there's kind of these trade-offs and you can, and you can pick and choose, but I think, you know, realistically, um, if you're comparing like um, centralized versus decentralized, um, you know, anything that's, de that's decentralized, that's sufficiently profitable, somebody's going to professionally uh, work towards that, right? So then it all just ends up on AWS anyway, right? So, um, yeah, I think there is like, there's a distinction because, you know, you can still like do this at home, right? Like, Ideally, you run an e-validator on AWS, but you can still run it on a Raspberry Pi, right? And I think having that option is the most important thing because, again, like during a bull market, it doesn't matter. Go out there, make your money, have your fun, right? But when the bear markets come, when the uncertainty comes, when, um, you know, when really political things start, uh, you know, getting involved, like it's important to have those fallbacks, I think. Yeah, I agree. And it's important to have the Raspberry Pi's incentivized somehow. Uh, otherwise, the fact that it is possible to run, but if you are still 100% in, in AWS, then things are not going to work. 
Right. And that's, that's very much like my, my rule of thumb is like, can, can you run this on a Raspberry Pi? Right. Like our, um, you know, at Superfluid, we have a, sort of a, a decentralized, you know, network of bots that basically monitor the network and, you know, they, they have their incentive mechanisms, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Most professionals are going to go and run these on AWS, of course, but um, you know, I, I did actually try this like a while back. It's like, you know, put it on a Raspberry Pi to see if it would work. It was slow, but it worked. Right. So um, that's the key. Definitely. Yeah. For sure. For sure. So back into Defender a little bit. Mm -hmm. Was the process of building Defender really the same in terms of like the technical specs and the development process and the cycles? Was the thinking very similar to just any other traditional SaaS product or did you have to incorporate different things than maybe you did in your previous work because it was a Web3 application? Um, I'm, I'm curious about that because I'll ask a couple of follow-up questions either way. Uh, no, I would say that the development process was pretty much aligned with a traditional uh, software application. Yeah. Uh, for sure, I mean, the technical challenges are, are different because you're interacting with stuff that it's, it's different. Like Ethereum has a complete, completely unique set of challenges when you're working with it. Like uh, you're building monitoring infrastructure, okay, but on a blockchain, you need to account for reorgs. Uh, you're sending transactions. You're, it's, is it like calling an API? Well, no, it calls, it's calling an API, but maybe if it, the API is too busy, you have to pay more to get your request in there. Um, it's, it has this set of very, very unique challenges that you need to design for, but they were part of the design, like of the product that we're trying to solve, not of the tech stack that, that we were using. Makes sense. And then again, this, because this is, you know, if sometimes we ask people that build protocols that are open source by default, like this question, and it's easy to answer, but I, I understand if you don't answer this one directly, but I'd love to know if there are any optimizations or particular design patterns that you've built and worked on within the Defender product that you just feel really proud of and wish you could share with more people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we're, we're pretty transparent about how, how the architecture works. Uh, some of it, it's even available on our docs. Um, I have two in particular in mind that I really like how they turned out. Uh, one of them comes to uh, relay your key management. Like within Defender, we let you spin up what we call relayers, which is basically like an entity that gets assigned a private key just for your team to manage. Um, you tell the relayer, hey, get this transaction on chain for me. Um, the relayer will take care of figuring out the nonce, like increasing it atomically, figuring the correct gas price, signing the transaction, broadcasting it to multiple network providers, keep monitoring it to make sure it's, uh, it gets mined and resubmitting as needed. Like It does all the work for you. But it has this very, very, very important piece, which is it has a particular address that's only manageable by you. And that means that we really need to take care of that private key. And so we eventually managed to leverage, uh, leverage the AWS KMS, the key management system, which is backed by like, hardware security modules. And we manage all signing operations, all key operations directly within the KMS. That means that the private key is never on program memory. Like no one ever can see your private key. And that's by design. Like we have many users that come to us and say, Hey, I've been using Defender a lot, yada, yada, but I would like to export the private key because I want to do something else. No, that's like, you cannot export it. And that's by design. Like it's locked in there and every transaction that we need to sign, we take the hash, we send it to the power security module and get the string back. Like no one ever is even remotely close to your private key. And the other thing that ended up pretty well that's also related to this is uh, we are making very, very heavy use of uh, AWS IAM, that's uh, Identity Access Management Policies, uh, for fine-tuning what each and every request can do within Defender. So whenever you send a request um, to Defender's API, whether it's from the front end or the external API, like at the author authorization level, we generate a set, a, a set of dynamic policies that restrict exactly what you can do to make sure that you don't have access to any services or to any records that are beyond uh, your team uh, your team rights. So it's enforced at the permissions level that there is no chance that your team can accidentally touch or see something that belongs to another team. And that applies to, for sure, private keys, but also to pretty much any other resource, any record in the database, any asset that your team owns within the multi-tenant structure in Defender. Like, Whenever a request comes in, it's instantly isolated. So it's at the permissions level, so it can only modify your own stuff. 
And that ended up pretty working pretty well. Um, going back a little bit to what you were asking at the point about uh, DevEx, it makes DevEx a little bit more painful because it means that we have a new suite of errors to, to, to deal with. Like, oh, I forgot to add this particular permission to dynamically generate policy to this role that happens when this... And yes, that is a pain. Um, that um, the main problem that we found is that those kind of errors don't pop up until like the very end of the development phase. Like you can have unit tests for working, like if you want to do TDD, or you can have local development or local emulation of what happens. Uh, that works great, but these kind of errors are not going to pop up until you actually get your stuff running on AWS and you start testing the the end to end. Yeah, it's interesting. I guess that's just, that's the the open Zeppelin security first mindset right there, right? That's the uh, you know, you're willing to go to more pain yourself and your team to make sure that people have, don't have access to things they shouldn't have access to and that the private key is, is safe. So I, I like that a lot. I didn't realize, what was the name of the the type of hardware you were or service you were using with AWS? Oh, it's uh, KMS. It's the key management system, which is basically a managed uh, set of uh, hardware security models by, by AWS. Very cool. So you also mentioned that it opens up the not opens up one, but uh, Defender has an an API, an external API as well. Did I understand yeah. that right? Yeah. Cool. Correct. So so Josh and I spend a lot of time on API development, right? So we have SDKs we maintain uh, for Superfluid, which is our protocol. Uh, we think a lot about we debate a lot internally about like you know how many abstractions do we add? <laughs> how do we do this? So I'd love any like just general advice about how you've approached API development. Right? Like, do you like to have, do you like to give people access all the way down to the bare metal? Do you like adding lots of abstractions for the sake of newcomers? How do you tend to think about that? So, uh, what we did and what I usually like doing is having a, a very basic layer for the API, like that one to one maps to the resources or the most atomic operations that the user can do. And that's like the base layer. And um, the idea is that. That layer lets you do whatever it makes sense for you to do within the API. Is it going to be easy or not? Eh, it depends on what you want to do. But it's low level and it gives you all the building tools, all the basic building blocks that you need to get the, to get the job done. Once we have that, we use that to create more high level APIs for very specific use cases that we see that people are needing. Uh, I think that upgrades are probably one of the best examples here. Like, Part of Defender, uh, there's a, Defender, a component in Defender called Defender Admin, which is basically a user interface for reviewing and approving administrative proposals that go through a multi sig time block, or a government contract. And it has like special logic for handling upgrades. And you can create these sort of upgrade proposals from API. So we're seeing some users that like hook Defender to their CI/CD pipeline, where they deploy their new versions, they get everything ready, and then they send a proposal to be approved by the multi sig owners of where it is within Defender. And that works, that's great. But it requires some plumbing to actually build how this upgrade proposal is going to look like. So we ended up building a plugin for Hardhat that's connected also to the upgrade plugins that, that like the free and open source that we offer from open settling contracts, that basically you enter one line saying, hey, I want to propose an upgrade to this version of the code. And under the hood, we take care of compiling that new version, doing all the checks that you need to do to make sure it's upgrade safe, deploying it, registering it, and creating the proposal for, hey, I want to take this version of the code into this new version with already everything configured for you. And that takes care of interacting not just with the Defender API, but also it's going to make multiple requests to the chain to understand how your project is doing. It's going to look locally for your source code to compile it. Like, it's interacting with many, many different moving pieces, but it's probably as high level as you can get it's that it's a one liner that describes your intent that I want to go from this version of the code to this one, like do stuff. And that's built on top of the low level APIs for sure. And that's, that's typically the way we manage. Like we look for the common use cases and if we can, we build a high level API on top of that. If it's not possible for whatever reason, where well, it's technical, time, resource constrained. At the very least, we look into building a guide or documentation for guiding users on step by step on how to do that. Gotcha. So you approach this this process of building APIs as having a thin wrapper around basically everything, 
And then you pick off specific use cases and say, all right, let's make this particular thing a lot easier than just dealing with the, the bare metal stuff, right? I think that's that's the right philosophy. And that, that's actually something uh, that you were arguing at our offsite the other day, Josh. So that's uh, you, you should feel vindicated. <laughs> yeah, a, a nice one that we shipped recently is uh, we're seeing many projects like abusing the APIs for doing like sort of infrastructure as code within Defender. Like they, they could have a declarative um, declarative configuration of what their Defender setup would look like. Um, they could do some really nasty things with the script to, to set everything up. And so we ended up being a plugin for serverless framework where they can just like throw in a YAML with all the functions, all the layers, all the things, and all the glue between them that they need, fully declarative, and they send like a one-liner for, for deploying, and we take care of doing all that reconciliation between their configuration and what's actually up there. And again, this is all built using the low-level APIs. Very cool. Yeah, so thanks for letting us pepper you with questions about, about Defender and all the different APIs and things. Um, I have like a, just a few general questions for you throughout the rest of our time here that I think would just be interesting to ask you. Um, one thing we like to ask people, uh, especially people like, like yourself that have been heads down grinding on the same thing for a little while, um, is like if you had six months where it's like, hey, you couldn't work on Open Zeppelin for six months, uh, what would you spend time on? Like what other areas of the space like, do you, are you just really bullish on and interested in that other people should maybe take a look at? I have two things that I would like to see solved. Account abstraction and multi-chain governance. Like there are the two things that today bother me the most on um, that they're still not solved. Um, multi-chain governance is starting to pop up a lot. Like you see more and more projects that, yeah, we have our main deployment, but now we're also in Polygon, we're in Arbitrum, and we're releasing to Optimism. Oh, and CK Sync is coming up next week. And uh, you have a problem with the uh, big problems with, with the governance there. Because, okay, how do users vote? How do they participate in the protocol? Like everything is on mainnet. You have like a centralized control center there, but how do you communicate to the, with the rest? Or for projects that don't rely on chain governance, that they use multi-signature wallets, we, we're seeing many projects that, well, they just replicate the same multi sign on every chain they are in which means that their signers need to sign everything four or five times, depending on how many chains they want to operate. Like today, I don't see any tools that have the capability of saying, okay, this is the chain, this is the contract from where I make the decisions, sorry, where the protocol makes the decisions. And from there, in sending directions to these contracts on the same chain, those other contracts on the other chain, and I don't care about bridges. I want this magically solved. Why? Because you're a developer, you're busy to building your product, you're a stakeholder, you're, maybe you're not even technical and you need to have the tools to review and understand what the change is going to be. Uh, like today, that's something that's, that's really missing and I would love to see, like all the building blocks are there. We have message passing across bridges, we have governance and multi sig contracts, we have good time locks, but there's nothing, there's no tool tying that uh, all together. And by tool, I mean something that doesn't require technical knowledge to use. Like that's something that we have made a very, very strong focus when building the administration tools on Defender. Like what we see is that 90% of multi sig signers are not technical. Like what usually happens is you have like a, I don't know, five of nine multi sig where you have the lead developer that's going to create a proposal for what's needs to happen. And the guy goes, hey, can you sign this to the COO, the COO, the CFO, the other people outside the, you know, outside the project. And they go and say, sure, what is, is it the green button I have to click? Yeah, okay, yeah, click. And that's okay because like these people don't have the tools today to understand what are the implications of what they're signing. Um, like on Defender Handling, we, Put a lot of effort on building UX that makes it easy for, for non-technical people to understand the implications of, of signing, of pushing a proposal forward. That's also super important to the community of end users, like the end users of a, of a project are not going to be also really developers. They need to be able to understand, hey, proposal 64 is coming. Sure, the description says this, but I need some way of verifying that when it actually lands, when it's executed, it's going to be doing this, this, or that. And they want to see better tuning for that and better tuning for that that goes multi-chain. Yeah, that makes total sense. I mean, the, the bridging space and message passing space, it's, it's definitely blowing up right now in terms of new tooling. 
But this is all still very, very technical stuff, right? In order to really understand what's going on, you have to yeah. spend a lot of time, right? To do anything cross chain like that, that's not just like standard bridging of tokens, it does take a long time. So I'm with you there. I hope th- I hope someone does uh, does solve that. On the, on the account abstraction bit, you mentioned that. What's your take on some of the new developments there? Like, are you particularly bullish on some of the new proposals? Uh, do you hope that that particular uh, outline gets implemented? Like, what do you what do you think is going to happen? I'm not going to take a stance between the two. I competing the IPs right now. Uh, I have the uh, yeah thirty seventy four and forty three thirty uh, seven, uh, which is like the, all the discussion on crypto Twitter. Like, we argue for one for the other. No, but they are complementary. We shouldn't be choosing one or the other. Okay, but we have limited time. But if I had six months, I would like take one of them to actually go and really understand the implications of both of them. But honestly, account abstraction is something that has bothered me pretty much since I joined the space. And I recall that Vitalik's first proposals on account abstraction date back to, hell, the very, very first few years of Ethereum. And I'm very annoyed that it's 2022 and we still haven't been able to achieve it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, the this mindset of taking some of these other, this off-chain infrastructure to make UX better, that would be accelerated even more by really high quality account abstraction because it would just improve the UX. It would allow the, you know, you know, things to be handled in different ways, right? So I'm, I'm with you on being very bullish there. Um, so it makes a lot of sense. And, and you're in Buenos Aires right now, right? That's right, yeah. Nice. What do you think of the Latin American? I guess this is a good question, right? Because Bogut's is coming up. I don't know if you're going to be yeah. in Bogut's. Yeah, 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 yeah. there. Wonderful. Um, we'll have to we'll have to say hello. But Bogut's is coming up, right? It's going to be a huge event. The Latin American community seems to be very excited. I, I met quite a few people in Mexico City a month ago at an ETH Global event there. Um, I'd love to just get your your take on where you think the ecosystem is going to to, to go in, in Latin America. I mean, Buenos Aires is obviously like a pretty fintech forward city, mm-hmm. but, you know, would love to just get a, a sense from someone on the ground. Absolutely. So Buenos Aires and Argentina in general has a pretty interesting combination, which is a strong uh, entrepreneurial spirit by many of the people who, who live here and uh, a very well justified uh, fear of banks and institutions when it comes to managing finance. Uh, so people are used to looking for ways of managing and securing their own money, which don't depend on bank, uh, which means that crypto is fertile ground for adoption here. Uh, like it's common to see billboards saying like, Hey, saving die. Uh, and like, actually, if you go to Google trends and search for interesting and search, uh, searches worldwide for Ethereum die, you'll see that most of the searches come from Argentina. Um, and that's because it's on our, on our DNA, like to have, to look for other ways for saving. Like the very basic uses of crypto, which is, hey, I want a store of value where I'm the custodian of my own money. That resonates a lot with people here in, in Argentina and also in a lot in many other parts of Latin America. That's still just one use case, right? Like the very basic, the, most Bitcoin-like use case of, of crypto. I think that crypto is a lot bigger than that. Um, I wouldn't be on the space otherwise. Um, and I think that what, what crypto can push for is more, more like true globalization and decentralization. Um, I know that this sounds like a bit opposite with what I was talking about, about it's a fine for a project to start centralized and then gradually decentralized. But the thing I like, I like for crypto is that it opens the door for anyone to join and participate on a protocol or a user. Like, this is probably something that you don't understand much if you're from the US or Europe. But for someone in Latin America, especially in countries where like some things have, we don't have full access to many things, like, not even on basic things, like you get used to going to a site, you start reading news and like you get to, this video is not available in your country. Uh, like the, those things, you you kind of get used to it, but you don't really like them. So when when a new product, a new product comes in that says, "Hey, you know, it doesn't matter where you're based. Like the playing field is the same for everyone." That's huge. Like that that means a lot for for people outside uh, first world countries. And uh, like one particular innovation that I've always loved, and from 
from the recent years was was flash loans within DeFi. Um, because basically flash loan lets everyone participate on, on finance without having money. Like you only need to see the opportunity. You only need the smarts. You don't need to have a, a huge bag of cash next to you to make an arbitration or to invest or to seize an opportunity. It's like truly democratizing access to, uh, to financial protocols. Like having actual true and free access to a protocol, it's step one. But if you're charging $20 for every transaction to enter, it's not really decentralized. You're, you're still restricting it to people who can actually participate. The moment you start adding more things for lowering those fees, for letting people participate, even though they don't have a huge cash of bag next, uh, sorry, few bag of cash next to them, that's when things start getting interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty bullish after just visiting a couple of times and, and seeing the ecosystem. Not I haven't actually ever been to Argentina. I'll have to visit sometime, but Latin America in general, I'm bullish on when it comes to crypto. So I'm excited. I'm excited. And and I'm happy that the the, the opportunity to succeed is, is actually becoming truly like like equal. You know, and I, I don't think the people that are within the US and Europe that have grown up going to really fancy schools and kind of walking into the their ecosystem without having to really put in much effort for it. I don't think they're ready for the level of competition they're about to face when it comes to building the next iteration here. So yeah. I think that crypto and pandemic was a very interesting combination in that regard. Like pandemic showed that, hey, you don't have to be in place uh, together with, like physically together with other people to build something. Like you can really collaborate with people across the screen and it works. Sure, human contact and you want to meet people you work with and it's, it's, it's something super important. But for day-to-day -day operations, you can work with someone that's 10 blocks away from you or 10,000 kilometers away from you and it works. Um, crypto as a tool, as a platform to enable that fully decentralized collaboration that, well, we, we were sort of forced into it because of the pandemic. Uh, I think that's an interesting combination. Totally. Totally. Okay. So, so last question for you, and then we can, we can wrap things up. This is something we, we've asked at every episode. We've gotten interesting answers every time, but let's, let's imagine we fast forward 10 years from now, it's 2032. Uh, and you wake up and look around at crypto, Web3, whatever you want to call it, and where, where it's actually come. Where do you, what do you hope things look like in 10 years? How do you hope these, this all plays out? It's a general question. Take it wherever you want, but I'd love, I'd love your answer. I think that going back to what we were discussing a couple of minutes ago, that there is no Web3. It's, it's web development. It's development, period. And crypto is another tool, and that's it. Um, it's fully integrated with uh, with the development of any of any application. Like sure, you can have a database, you can have a smart contract. Um, it works like that. It's there is no strict separation between Web two and Web three development. Like they become integrated into a single thing. Uh, that's for sure one thing I, I would love to see. Um, and the other is seeing crypto evolve for, evolve beyond the, uh, the strictly financial applications. Uh, today, there is a very, very strong um, binding between, sure, crypto is for money. Um, NFTs started turning it around a little bit. We start seeing more and more gaming applications. But where I, I would really like to see crypto is a sort of a, a say, neutral ground for integrations between different protocols and different applications. Like... Yeah, sort of a de truly decentralized computer where you can go for having the complete synergy and complete intercommunication between different applications and different protocols, whether they are crypto native or not, because again, that distinction is going to matter less and less as we move, for as we move forward. But I can totally see how protocols that, sorry, projects, applications that have been traditionally been isolating, they start connecting to the blockchain as a means to say, hey, like, this is the part this is sort of my API in a way, but instead of interacting by, hey, just sending me a request, sending a request back and forth, I'm actually putting the assets that represents what means to be operating and to be playing in this application on chain. And we're computing and we're playing that according to these rules that, hey, they happen on neutral ground. And that gives you the ground for uh, interacting between different applications. 
without them needing to be collaborative because in there, in that blockchain space, like code is law and we can trust on that. I love that. Yeah, I like the I like the sober view of it being a tool, right? A very powerful tool. One that's going to open up a lot of opportunity, but it is a tool, right? And, you know, sometimes I wish instead of, instead of all the fighting and, and the tribalism, we could just acknowledge that it's a tool and we want it to be useful. So I like that vision. Cool. Well, Santiago, where can people find you online? Where would you like to point people? Yeah, usually Twitter. I would say that's the, the best place to find me. Definitely. Awesome. Cool. We'll link to your, your book that you wrote a couple of years ago in our show notes. So make sure people can see that. Uh, I'll link to your, your, your Twitter account. Um, and we'll also just link to, to Defender and some of your work you've done there. So we really appreciate this. We, it's been fun having you on. This has been a fascinating conversation. And yeah, we love it. Likewise. Yeah, have a blast. Thank you so much, guys, for, for having me here. Of course. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.